Good afternoon. My name is Felita Tut, the Education Chair under Vice President Karen Mazzola and Madam President Carolyn Nelson Garrett. Welcome to the focus on multilingual learners under the Education Committee. I'm going to turn it over to our Vice President of Education Development, Karen Mazzola. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate the welcome. Um, you're in for a real treat today. And um, regarding multi-language learners, not just bilingual, I've, I've gotten a real education and I hope you will too. And I will bring uh, Carolyn Nelson Godard on for greetings. Thank you, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's edition of Road to Success. I'm really happy to have you here, especially given the subject matter which will be presented by Ryan. In a state as diverse as Florida, more attention should be given to our multicultural, multi-language speaking students. And today's Road to Success will highlight that and give us lots of information on how we can be better advocates for all students. Uh, thank you again for being here. Uh, please make sure that you I'm not with you later on, that you register for leadership convention, but I know that Karen or and Felita will bring that up to you. Back to you. Karen, back to you. Thank you. Um, for introductions, I believe Felita is introducing our speaker today. Yes. We have, uh, I would like to introduce our committee first, which is um, Edeline Joseph. I don't think she's on at the time. She's our vice chair for the education committee and Enrique Escalon for exceptional student education. And our speaker for today, Dr. Ryan Porter, English language learners. Would any of you like to say hi? Okay, take it over, Ryan. <laughs> All right, thank you and welcome. It's really a, a pleasure to be in such good company um, and to be able uh, just to, to experience this all together. Um, so officially, good afternoon, buenos dias, if you're still uh, over on the west side of the panhandle. Um, before we kick it off, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody of our mission here at Florida PTA, which is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself uh, before we got going, because uh, I find uh, positionality or who we are and, and how we see ourselves in the world and sometimes how we are viewed by others in the world um, as really important in this work that we do as parents, as teachers, uh, as family members, as students, et cetera. Um, that way, hopefully, you'll have a, a little bit of confidence in me, but also um, experience some humility on my part as well. Because um, as you'll see, uh, my experiences help me to understand uh, and be able to talk about a lot of things, but also leave a lot of space open um, for learning. So I was born in rural New Jersey. Um, yes, there are rural parts of New Jersey. It is the Garden State. Um, <laughs> it, it was and is a monolingual, monocultural part of the state. Um, when I was growing up, I thought that people looked like me, sounded like me, and that was the end of the world. Um, uh, as we all know, that's not the case. Um, and I could real quick fast forward to the end, of, well, the current end of the story, which is me in Miami for a while, and Miami being much, much, much more multilingual and multicultural uh, very much feels like more home to me than anywhere else has. Um, but when I was in seventh grade, I had the opportunity to learn Spanish. Uh, I was good at it. I liked it. Uh, I moved on to high school. I had a really supportive teacher for three of the four years that I took uh, Spanish, um, and she pushed me, uh, she challenged me, she was uh, nice to me, it was the only class that I spoke in, um, and we are still in touch today. Uh, we got to have lunch together with our families last summer, and we're hoping to do it again this summer. Um, so then when I went to my undergrad in Boston, 
I ended up majoring in Spanish or what Boston College called Hispanic studies, um, where uh, because of the Jesuit education, there was a strong emphasis on social justice. Um, and at the same time that I was uh, seeing a lot of the differences in the world, very different from uh, my sheltered upbringing, um, I was pushed to study abroad. And I say pushed, but I was supported to study abroad. So uh, although my parents were reticent of me leaving home, uh, my high school Spanish teacher, some folks at the university, uh, and some friends thought that it would really be good for my development. Uh, so I went to Madrid. I was there. I, I continued learning Spanish, got to meet new people, and I really developed a love for language. I mean, I remember sitting at my desk, um, looking out onto a busy street with lots of noise, which was not something I liked growing up and was not accustomed to in the, my rural New Jersey area where I worked on a farm bailing hay in the summers. And I just remember feeling so happy and so complete and feeling like part of that reason was due to language in, in my becoming bilingual. So I knew that I wanted uh, language, and particularly Spanish, to be a part of my life, personally, professionally, if I was really lucky, both. Um, so after graduating, I moved to the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, which is literally along the border. So if you think San Antonio, four hours south of that, uh, I was privileged to teach in a dual language school, right, where the children learned different subjects through both English and Spanish. Um, I was tasked with being the third grade teacher who taught in Spanish. Um, and I was introduced to these new ways of communicating where previously uh, I had been used to uh, English was over here, Spanish was over here, they were very separate things. Um, and that was not my experience when I moved to the Valley. And so I developed all these different questions, questions about language, questions about teaching, questions about learning, questions about assessing. Um, as, a, as a teacher, I wasn't sure um, if I was doing things right, and I wanted, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted. there's a little uh, feedback in the background. I don't know if you need to mute me, but uh. so then after I finished my time in Texas, I moved over here to Miami. I've been here this June will be 17 years. Um, I taught for another year in second grade, also as a dual language teacher, but this time in English. Then I worked for an educational nonprofit down here for a couple of years, and then the questions boiled up so much that uh, I knew I needed to go back to school. Um, so I did a PhD program at the University of Miami. I had the privilege of working with um, preschool children and teachers, um, and I fell in love with um, really learning with and learning from um, the teachers, and particularly the ways that they um, used their bilingualism. So in this case, it was a lot of English and Spanish to help the students um, achieve different things. So it might have been something like learning a new word. Um, it might have been uh, creating uh, more complete sentences. It might have been uh, even just teaching a new concept uh, like colors or uh, shapes or whatever the, the area might have been that day. And so after my time at UM as a grad student, um, I worked at Miami-Dade College as a professor in their School of Ed for four and a half years, and now I've been over at FIU or Florida International University here in Miami for um, five, five and a half years. Um, and for me, getting to, like I said, learn from and learn with the students, many of whom are from here or who have been here for a long time, is um, a really humbling experience and a really exciting experience, just because there's so much difference um, often between the students and me, but also among the students. And so it leads to a really rich opportunity for learning. So I'm officially starting here today looking at the map of our state of Florida. And the reason is because I want you to see and you know how big it is. Um, and it is not only big, but it's the state with the third most multilingual learners in the country. But even given that fact, we don't have a systematic way for documenting or evaluating how we support them bilingually or multilingually as they attempt to learn in school when they're still developing two or more languages. So that's why I want the focus of our time together to be around what it means to be bilingual or multilingual, what that means 
for the education that our multilingual students are legally entitled to and what language support most of our multilingual students are and maybe not experiencing in schools. So I'm going to start off here. I know it's blank. It's white. That's on purpose. And I'm going to have a couple of pictures for you to take a peek at. And when you do, I want you to ask yourselves, what is the message that's being conveyed? And why might it be conveyed that way? So what is it saying? And why are they saying it that way? I know it's a little bit small, so I'll read it too. Um, this is a billboard that used to be on one of the highways around here in Miami. And it says, Oye, my friend, aquí tenemos tu perfect match. Right? So you might add, oh, and it's for a car dealership, right? So if you want to pop in the chat or if you just, you know, feel so inspired that you want to unmute, feel free to, to chime in. Otherwise, uh, I'll wait a couple of seconds and I'll go on to the next one. Uh, and I'm happy to explain them when I'm done. But there'll be a, a, a little collage here in, in about a minute. I have another one that was taken, I think, on Miami Beach, and it says, scratch parquear off your to-do list. And it's an ad for Lyft, right? Uber, Lyft. Um, there's another one. Como agente de bilingüe de Aflac, tu vales por two. We're hiring. Click here. And then wash your hands to prevent illness. And you can see the different languages that are there. I see there's a comment in the chat. So Karen says, why not all Spanish? That is a great question, right? Why not all Spanish? Why not all English? Why not, you know, in the, the wash your hands one, just, just one language? And that's exactly what we're going to get into today, right? So as bilinguals or as multilinguals, all of the language that's up here is always there. We're just often asked to turn part of it off. But when we're allowed to use everything that we have up here, sometimes it comes out like this, right? And so when you're around uh, bilingual and multilingual people who are together, you might hear them interact in these types of ways. It doesn't mean they always do. It doesn't mean they have to uh, do this, which a lot of people think of as mixing languages. I'll call it translanguaging. Um, but it can happen. And so I want to push a little bit deeper. I'm going to show you on the next slide. I have some examples of some things that uh, mostly my daughters have said, but a couple other people's have give people, excuse me, have given me examples of um, something that's important for you to know is that the examples that are from my daughters um, are there because they have been raised so far. They're 11 and eight as uh, Spanish English bilinguals. So I happen to use mostly Spanish with them. My wife uses mostly English with them. Uh, their first, what, three to five years of education, uh, so their early childhood years from infancy until uh, through pre-K, were almost all in Spanish, um, and now they get some Spanish in school. Um, so here, right, our, 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 you can see all the words appear in English, but bilinguals said them. And so our older daughter, one time we were at my parents' house, and she she's looking at the sink, and she was like, open the sink. And so if you only spoke English, you'd probably, you know, raise an eyebrow and be like, you want me to do what now? But what she was really asking for was that mommy or I, abriera la llave, that we open, literally it's open the key, but another way to say it is turn on the water. And so what happened is she used her knowledge of Spanish, but she said it like it was English. Or the next two examples, we also just read them in English but they were provided to me by some students who were bilingual in both Haitian Creole and in English. And they said, especially their parents will go around and, and scold them and say, close the light. And so in Haitian Creole, similar to Spanish, you might say something that sounds like that, right? And same with broom the floor, right? So for the first one, we might say, turn off the light. For the second one, we might say, uh, sweep the floor. But in some other languages, that's literally how you say it. And so what's happening here is you're just using all English words, but you're saying it based on another language. And sometimes that happens. It doesn't have to happen, but sometimes that happens with bilinguals. This is something that, uh, again, the older daughter said one time, my wife had taken the two girls and they were at a drive-up window and uh, nobody was coming over. 
And my daughter looks at my wife and she says, uh, why is he not contesting you? And I would love to tell you that she was just so smart that, you know, she was like, well, why is there no, you know, verbal battle going on right now? But no. So what was happening is this word contesting is a little bit like a word in Spanish, which is contestar, which means to answer. So why is he not answering you as in why is he not coming over to you? So again, there's a lot of knowledge here of more than one language that the people who are saying these things are using. Because naturally we do, and really we're pretty creative with it, right? And so what I wanted you to see first here in these examples is that it looks like it's all English, but it's kind of not. And it doesn't just have to be English, right? So uh, a lot of times in Spanish, I'll hear this expression, llamame para atrás. And so among Spanish speakers or bilingual Spanish English speakers, um, you often will hear this expression or an expression like it. Now, when you talk to some Spanish speakers, they might get a little uh, frustrated because literally in, in just monolingual Spanish, it means like, call from behind me. But a loose translation would be, call me back. So it's just the opposite of what we saw before, right? We're using all Spanish words, but we're saying it based on English where we say, call me back. So regardless of the language or the languages that you use, you can still speak only one, but it could be based on another. Or sometimes we look at them and there's there's sort of some obvious words that come from both. So I'm so sad. It's not a misspelling. She didn't get confused. Right? She said, I'm so sad. I'm so sad. I need mm, some water, right? I'm so thirsty, which is a combination of the word choice and the way that you would say it. Tengo tanta sed or mucha sed, which is literally I have so much thirst or I'm so thirsty in English, right? Or with the other one, puta tampa, which was a, 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 an example from my dean who uses Portuguese with her kids. And when they were younger, they used to say, mommy, put the tampa, put the tampa, right? The top. So put the top on the bottle. And I'll go through a couple more here. Um, and then I, we won't go through every one, one by one. But I just want you to have an idea of some of the things that real people have said as bilinguals and multilinguals. Something we always do. And especially as younger bilinguals or multilinguals, um, since we're talking about our children, right? And since we're parents. So uh, this this one right here that she's chupping her dedo, right? that's kind of hard to, to analyze because there's might be two words that we think of as English. If you know Spanish, you might see one down here. And then you look at this one here, chupping, which you're probably not going to find in a dictionary of any sort. But really what's happening is big sister was looking at little sister when they were younger. Little sister was doing this. And big sister looked at mommy and says, mommy, mommy, she's chupping her dedo. Right? So she took the chup from chupar, which is the suck, and that ing, that suffix from English, and she, boop, put them together. That's pretty bilingual, I think, right? When we talk about bi, two, lingual, putting those two right with each other. So she created a new word, right? Bilingualism is creative. It's a sign of intelligence. It's normal. Same down below, there's a couple more. Uh, he's ronking. She was talking about the dog. Ronking, again, not a word you're probably going to find in any dictionary. But uh, we have a pug. Uh, pugs have pushed in faces, so sometimes it's a little bit hard to breathe. And especially when he sleeps, you hear, right? And so Anna says, he's ronking for roncar, which is to snore. And again, you see that ing. And the last one is desnudis. We're desnudis. So it was bath time. And for all of us who have had kiddos, uh, sometimes bath time is very easy and fun. And for us, at least, lots of times, not so much. So the bath was ready. We'd finally gotten the clothes off the girls, and instead of hopping in the tub, it was running around saying, Desnudies, we're desnudies, which came from, right, nude, you might hear and understand that in English, and my wife used to call them little nudies, and so Anna took that and said desnudies, because desnuda, or desnudo in Spanish, is naked. Right? So again, in all of these different examples, whether you see just English, just Spanish, some combination, 
new words, they come about because it's impossible to turn off one or more of the languages. They're always up there. Now, can we learn to just say, turn on the water? Of course. Can we learn to just say, we're naked or estamos desnudas? Of course. And do we often? Yes. Right? But we also do this. So I, I like to start with some of the more um, challenging ones. Here are others. I won't go through them all, but you'll, you'll have them later on. Um, and you can also take a look. The ones in the middle here are a little bit like we just ended with, where there might be some cleverly invented words. There's also some stories to go along with them. Uh, you can see some that are just in English, some that have a, a combination here, and another combination down here. Um, and so I want you to see, again, bilingualism or multilingualism, it's creative, it's intelligent, and it's normal, right? We're just so used to coming at things as monolinguals. Even if we are bilingual, multilingual, we've been raised in this world, even if you're from Miami, which people say is, you know, one of the most multilingual cities in the country, we still expect a, a monolingual performance of bilinguals. And I'm going to get more into that in a, in a little bit. So I gave you a couple of written examples, and I want to give you some, some spoken examples, too. So I have two quick ones, and I'm checking my time, we're okay, um, of some TV shows that have been around for a little while um, that you may or may not have seen. And as you're listening, what I want you to do is just think about the different languages you identify. Um, in other words, what languages do you hear? And uh, also ask yourself, do the people seem confused? Okay, so what languages do you hear and do they seem confused? Cinco dollars for un burrito? We've been giving you free burritos for years. Yo cante por esos tacos. Ah, Nobody asked you to sing. You ain't shit there, bro. We need a new approach. I'll give you a brand new list of ingredients that we can try out and it's gonna be great. People love discovering new things. No, we've been here, fool. You haven't paid rent in two months. You double the rent on us, you coconut salad. Coconuts are delicious. And those pinches greedy landlords that nos quieren convertir todos in ramen spot. Stay woke. Why you gotta go all the way to Paris to be a chef? I'm gonna back Michelin stars and boil Heinz. Estamos preocupados por Chris. Chris is going to be fine. He can afford help like therapy or Whole Foods. Can you take Whole Foods? Yo estoy aquí. All right, so there's one. Remember that those questions, what language or languages can you identify? And do the people seem confused? In other words, can they still understand each other and communicate with each other? Cinco. Another one. Got a sec. I thought you hated the way I painted your nails. What was she want? I saw your homework assignment. My favorite hobby is doing nails with Jessica. What are you with Lan? But we're not even friendly with each other. You don't even look at me when I do your nails. Oh, not sure you may watch your way dinger water, dear and cut. Hi, you are you sure how woman you hides a you eat our city the Shijia and how. Always crying during sports. Fred Couples. All right, and I'll stop it there. I'm gonna there. So I know you're looking at this next slide, but I'm just gonna ask that question first. And, and if you want, you can pop it in the chat or you can uh, unmute and say, but I, I want you to at least think about that. Do they look confused when they were communicating with each other? Either the first uh, example from Hentified or the other from Fresh Off the Boat. All right, I see a no from Robin. Any others, if any of the characters seemed confused? To me, no, they did not seem confused. <laughs> right. Thank you, Melanie. Mm -hmm. And says not at all. Yeah. So, I mean, I agree. 
to be fair, I'm totally biased, but I, I agree. Nobody looked confused. Um, and I think there's one more here. Wendy also says not at all. Cornelia says, uh, no, they did not. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I noticed a couple of things, right? In, in the Hintified, uh, the first example that we are looking at, some of the characters were using mostly English. Some of the characters were using mostly Spanish um, and also certain types of Spanish, right? Because um, not all Spanish is the same, just like not all English is the same. And, and some of the characters were using both English and Spanish. And they, they were all, from what I could tell, um, understanding each other. And in the second uh, example from Fresh Off the Boat, right, the, uh, the, the older woman and the younger woman were communicating, but one was not using English and one was using English. But in order to communicate, they obviously must have been able to understand each other and then were communicating in the other language. So I will argue that that's another form of bilingualism. And a lot of people um, in younger generations interact that way. So I don't know about anybody else, but for example, my children love to not answer me in Spanish when I speak to them in Spanish. Can they? Usually. Do they? Not that much. Now, we can argue about how strict I should be or not, but um, so that interaction that you saw in the second example is also another form of bilingualism. Now, why does all of that matter, right? We'll go to the slide that's right here. Because so often we end up saying things like, well, he doesn't know either language well. She's limited in both languages, right? But that's taking a fractional look or just looking at a piece of that person's language, right? That person needs to be looked at holistically. Why? Because a bilingual or a multilingual is not two monolinguals in one. So what does that mean? And that's old, look at that, see, 1989. Um, Oftentimes, what we expect and are told to expect is that to be bilingual, you have to use and understand two languages to the same extent. In other words, you should do the same things just as well. And even better, you should do all the things really well in both languages, or we're told you're not bilingual, right? Then we're told something like this. Well, uh, you don't know either language well. A lot of uh, children or students are told that, especially when they're raised bilingual from birth or from very early on. Or, well, she's, she's limited in both. They're like, well, I mean, you know, he doesn't really speak fill in the blank on a language. Whereas, right, when we have this holistic view, we can see bilingualism and biliteracy as on a continuum of different configurations of competence as it relates to actual use. And I'll unpack that a little bit, right? In other words, we use language differently based on the things we do, the places we are, and the people we're interacting with. Even monolingual people do this, right? So the way that you talk to um, a neighbor versus a husband versus a religious person versus a professor versus a judge, you probably change a little bit in the way that you talk to these different people. So monolinguals know what it's like to adjust their communication based on different circumstances or here, actual use, right? These different configurations and of competence, right? In other words, when we say competence, how well we feel like we know something or do something or how well or not others tell us we know something or do something. So with bilinguals and monolinguals, it's with two or more languages. But again, we tend to have this monolingual view. That's what I said a while ago, where we expect that you have to have this monolingual-like proficiency of each language to be bilingual. But that's just not really the way the world works. And so I'll give you, I'll give you a personal example, and then I'm going to invite you to think of some of your own. Um, I fully believe I am bilingual in English and Spanish. 
I speak Spanish with my kids. I have since they were born. I've been uh, using it to some extent for close to 30 years now. Probably started when I was 12 or 13. It's gotten better along the way. But when I had to go over to my neighbor's house to tell him about a problem with my lawnmower and ask him what in the world to do with it and how to fix it, I felt like a bumbling dum-dum. Right? So I went over there and, and I was trying my best, name parts, say what was happening. It's not that I don't speak Spanish, but my Spanish around motor things and especially lawnmowers, not there. Yeah, could it be there? Sure, but I haven't had the opportunity yet. So in some ways it makes sense that it's not there, right? That's what happens with our kids a lot of times, right? So we can, let's think of a school example. Uh, you might have a child who's using Haitian Creole at home most or all of the time, and they go to school and they know how to do some reading, maybe in Haitian Creole, how to do some writing, maybe how to uh, uh, speak, right? To do some math. Yep, Carolyn says skill is based on context. It's completely subjective and completely relative, or right? Um, so this child is a reader. If they can read in Haitian Creole, they're a reader, but they just can't yet read in English. Or they might know how to do some basic arithmetic in kindergarten, but they might not yet know how to express that in English, even though if they're given the opportunity, they likely could do it in Haitian Creole, right? So they are competent people. We are competent people as bilinguals and multilinguals, but we have to be viewed holistically. We have to take all of our language into account in order to really make decisions about competence. Right? So that's one of the reasons why assessments and these standardized assessments and whatever iteration we're on, right, with FCAT and FSA and now FAST, um, we should really have opportunities for our multilingual learners to be assessed in non-English languages, because there might be some things that they really do know, but they're not showing up when they're tested in just English. And that matters. All right, so let's move on a little bit. So that was a section on what does it mean to be bilingual or multilingual? Now I want to transition a little bit here and say, so now that we know that being bilingual or multilingual is a strength and that we should look at it from a strengths-based perspective, we ask ourselves, but then what are the labels that we use to describe this group of multilingual students? Right? So sometimes some people still use limited English proficient. And for any of those of you who are doing work with uh, the legislature and statutes, they still use this term, limited English proficient, right? So we're focusing on a deficit. It's a deficit perspective. In other words, what is not there yet, yet like one of my favorite words, right? And we're only focusing on English, whether it's limited English proficient or English language learner, we just talked about how bilinguals and multilinguals are working with two or more languages. So if that's the case, to just focus on English doesn't really make any sense. And we often hear the argument, but this is the United States. The United States doesn't have an official language. But we're in Florida and it's official English only. Well, it's not English only, it's a Florida official language, meaning that official business like that that takes place in the legislature or that that takes place with other elected bodies is conducted in English, right? That does not mean that school has to only be in English. And it definitely doesn't mean that our multilingual learners should be cut off from actually using all of their brains and their resources and their experiences that they have that might come in or from other languages, right? So we don't want to have a deficit of perspective. We don't want to focus on what's not there yet. We don't want to have this real unrealistic perspective of bilingualism, that you have to be two monolinguals to be bilingual. We don't want to focus on just one language, which is usually English in the United States. What we do want to do is adopt a more strengths-based perspective. And so here are two terms that uh, have been used a lot, um, both 
uh, in districts, in states, in research. Emergent bilingual, right? The idea. So we're uh, we're calling it what it is, bilingual, right? At least two languages. Um, emergent. Some people love the term emergent. Some people have a, a are a little bit challenged by it. Um, but emergent to me signals that we're at the beginning stages. So if perfection's a thing, which is debatable, then you're certainly not going to be it when you're at your emergent stages and bilingual, right? From the time you start, bilingual. What do we think bilingual? Two, two languages. So we want to know what the non-English language is. Who do they use it with? For what purposes do they use it? How might we assess them in another language so that we really know what they know and can do? Or multilingual learner. Right, so it's kind of a, a real nice uh, catch-all term where we're talking about uh, children and students who are learning any number of languages at any stage. Right, so we're at, we are recognizing the fact that children are coming to us with skills and experiences that matter. So that's why I've mostly used bilingual learner or multilingual learner throughout the presentation. So then. We know what a strength bilingualism, multilingualism is. We're thinking about some strengths-based terms for this group of students, right? Our children. What are they legally entitled to? In other words, when they go to school, what's supposed to happen, particularly if they take that home language survey, right? When you register a child for public school in the state of Florida, you have to answer three questions. They're always the same questions, no matter what district you're in. And essentially it's getting at, is a language other than English used a lot, the primary language, or is a child exposed to it? And if so, they're supposed to go to some type of language support program if an assessment determines that their English is not proficient enough, that they don't know enough English. So what are the options? Basically, it has to be one of a sound educational approach. That means it has to be based on real theory. Two, you got to have the right stuff to implement it. So you can say, well, we're going to, and you'll see some, some options on the next slide, but, uh, or excuse me, two slides from now. But if you don't have the right people, if you don't have the right books, if you don't have the right apps, uh, if you don't have the right space, you can't do it, right? So you have to have the right stuff, proper implementation. And then on top of that, we got to make sure it's working. So there's supposed to be program evaluation. All of this is not something that I'm making up. This comes from the Castaneda standards, which is from a Supreme Court case that started out in Texas in the early 80s, went all the way through, uh, and at this point has been adopted into Florida statute uh, as of 1990 in something called the Florida Consent Decree. Right. So by law, any child who now would be called an English learner, right? Or sometimes you might hear ESOL student or ESOL learner because they're in an ESOL program perhaps, right? And so, which is English for speakers of other languages. I would argue that multilingual learners or bilingual learners is more appropriate to, again, recognize the more than one language that that child is bringing with him, her, them. Um, and that we have to meet these three things. So I am asking this question, what are some of the programs that Florida has to support by in multilingual learners? Right, Because as parents, we should know. Because if our children are going to schools, we want to know what they're legally entitled to. And on top of that, I would hope that it's a program that really takes a strengths-based approach now that we understand how important by multilingualism is or are. So we're going to take a look here. And the reason that I have this continuum is because you'll find that the programs on the left are more bilingual and the programs on the right are going to be more English monolingual. In other words, English only. All right. So we, I'm not going to go through the different types. You can come to one of my classes if you want to. Um, but what I want you to know is that these are the types that actually support students using English and a language other than English, okay? Whereas these programs, so ESL, or Florida calls it ESOL, E-S-O-L, um, are programs that traditionally only use English, 
uh, in the classroom, but they do use special strategies to support students' learning of English. The reason this is on here as a submersion model is because sadly, uh, that still happens, but it is illegal. It means that nothing is being done for that child or those children who are classified as English learners. Um, you ask, well, how could that happen if it's illegal? Because on the previous slide, remember, there's no evaluation that our state is doing. I might not have said that. So that's the big problem. Our state has no particular way at this point of actually documenting these different programs that exist. Because as you're going to see on the next slide, there are no common definitions for these programs that we have. So each district gets to call it what they want, and the state just records it, and then nobody's going in to do the evaluations. So some of our children might be getting a wonderful buyer multilingual experience, and others might be getting a not so wonderful experience or none at all even if the school says that they are, or the district says that they are. This is the only one that's illegal. ESL or ESOL is allowable and is the best and only option sometimes. For example, if we live in an area where uh, most of the people who are there just speak English, then that's the program that you're gonna have to offer, right? So that number two from the slide before, if you don't have the right resources, people who speak the other languages of the students, then you can't do a bilingual program. But if you do have the resources, bilingual certainly is better. I'm not going to do this right now. Right, so as I said before, one of our biggest challenges is that we don't have definitions in the state of Florida. From here up, these are all considered bilingual programs and options that the state of Florida can use, and that uh districts and schools are using but again we don't know who's using them and if they are being used shall we say correctly uh and if they're working so as you'll see at my call to action at the end here we really need to urge policymakers and those at districts and the state level to make sure that something's happening right I will also say, and I'm not going to click on it now, but you can click on this later, and this is where it will take you. It's bilingual education in Florida. Um, so a uh, former UF professor, Maria Cody, and a graduate class of hers, uh, or excuse me, with students in a graduate class she was teaching, uh, started this process and we're contacting different districts to find out what programs they had. So if you actually go to uh, bilingualeducationfl.org, it'll take you here, and you can click on either view districts here or the districts up here, and not all 67, but uh, uh, at least 20 of them will pop up and give you some examples of those districts and the different programs they have. All right, so we have all this information, right? What it means to be bilingual and multilingual, the different ways that we have uh, referred to that group of students. Uh, we're also thinking about uh, the different programs that are out there that may or may not be uh, implemented and how well. And so I wanna leave you with this general call to action first on how to support our bi and multilingual learners, teachers, and families. Right? We might do that as we interact with uh, others, if we're going to school board meetings, if we're talking to teachers, if we're talking to principals, if we're talking to people uh, who might be our uh, other elected officials like state representatives or senators um, or anybody at the Department of Education. We can add for native, excuse me, advocate for native language assessment. Right? We want our kids to have the opportunity to test in languages other than English. So again, we have an accurate idea of what they know and can do. We need definitions for our different programs, right? So that when somebody says they're doing a dual language program, it means basically the same thing from one school to one school, from one district to the next district. We need to document these types of programs, where they are, how many are using them. We need to evaluate them. And we also want to continue to expand our understanding of multilingualism from a strengths-based perspective, right? Like the different examples from before. But what does this mean for you, perhaps in your own unit, right? 
what are some different ways that you can uh, make sure that the school district and different schools have interpreters or translators? By law, that's required. It doesn't have to be a person who's there physically, but there should at least be a call service for that. Making students be the translators or interpreters is not an acceptable option. It does happen, but even if the child says they're comfortable with it, that is not a legally appropriate avenue to follow. And in our units, we can advocate for better ways to refer to children who are using two or more languages, right? In other words, not limited English proficient, maybe not English learner, but thinking about something like emergent bilinguals or multilingual learners. And so I leave you with the question of what can you do to continue this advocacy, or even what do you do already? And I know we have a, a few minutes left, so if anybody would like to chime in, uh, it would be amazing to have that opportunity. And as you do, uh, just in case you're interested in chatting more, um, here's my information. Enrique has his hand up. I am sorry, yes. I'm not looking at the pictures. I will go back to that. Sorry. Yeah. Enrique. Yes. Um, no, uh, great presentation. Um, I know everything that you have said and I have lived it uh, as an immigrant in uh, into the country and uh, well-defined couple of things that I have. Basically, it, language is communication and basically is how do we understand it each other and uh, basically how an individual is bra brain is wired you know an example um, when I came to the states the first time to a scout camp I learned English pretty well you know if you can say that <laughs> and uh, when I went back I had difficulty back in Spanish and I was 16 years old and uh, my brother uh, he speaks yeah, he says in sponge, he speaks over six languages pretty well. So it is how your brain is. I have difficulty with one and transition to another. Also, it's education, the, how much my library is in my brain. So what words, and you said how you can translate it. And, and the emerging of languages, basically the Spanglish, the, uh, you know, uh, the modification of languages and it happens through years you know if you look at ancient languages that come in to come to the present latin for example it divides into spanish french etc cetera, etc cetera. the other thing that I in the presentation you say the multi-language uh, that you know we have a, an official language in florida it remind me when i was in india People talk different languages in everything and all communicated because they were fusion with English. Basically, the official business is English. That way, officially, we'll understand. It's a commonality. It's not that bad to have one thing in common that you know will force all to understand the same language. Uh, the other thing is, uh, it brought me. Uh, to the, you know, uh, with the deaf people, deaf people and translator and things like that, you know, it is, is um, and while you were talking about how we assess, if we look at programs, we fail, we have to look into the individuals. So it will remind me the IEPs. Why don't we have IEPs, individual education plans, for individuals with different languages. I think that that will be a way to advocate, uh, you know, like we have for people with disabilities. And the, in page 19, you say the submersion. Submersion is good, but depend how it's implemented. Uh, and, you know, basically is look at the individual, how it submerge. If you submerge a person in water, he may, <laughs> survive, but if you submerge it in another environment, you may drown. <laughs> so it's how it is, is how the submersion is done is, you know, is like you said, and you hit it 
is properly implemented with the individual. So I will focus more into the individuality of uh, how the person learns. So, um, and, you know, having a granddaughter now that she was forced to the first couple of years, just Spanish, because when she got English, oh, he, she pick it up. But, you know, she did the whole thing of uh, trying to talk in Spanish, like with an English accent, <laughs> things funny like that. But, you know, but the kids learn, they are, you know, if they are uh, submerged, uh, into the proper side, how they will learn. So evaluation is one key, understanding the person, the individual. Not two people are equal. Some programs are fine. In the case of programs is, for example, my son is blind with a stroke, a lot of challenges, and he, they are not programs in the state or in the nation for kids like that. And he went to a, a structured autism program and he uh, chimed, uh, you know, he used. So is looking at the individual and looking at the programs and placing in the person into the proper environment is key. And I don't want to take anything. <laughs> and uh, the legal portion, you know, page 19, basically it's, uh, I think, an individual education plan is will be a key. And that's yeah. my five cents. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Enrique. And, and I will say that um, by law, a child who is classified as an English language learner is supposed to have an ELL committee, which is akin to an IEP. Um, and that's part of that statute from uh, 1990. Um, and they are supposed to have this committee that's comprised of a parent, a teacher, an ESOL professional, and at least a school leader. Um, and so if a school does not convene that group to put together an individual plan for the child, then they are out of compliance legally. Um, so that, that's particularly important for us to know as parents that if we have a child who is uh, classified as an ELL, as an English language learner, we should be at least once a year invited to a meeting to create or review that plan. So yes, that's, that's very important. Thank you. Just I think I see a question in the chat. Um, do we know why Florida doesn't report their multilingual programs in the court, uh, correlation performance report for the Department of Education? I mean, excuse my, me, my answer is no. W without becoming overly political, I do not know the answer to that. But it is very much worth asking. Uh, um, I think wow. as a PTA, um, I think that we can educate the parents into the advocacy is the same way that we have done it for these students with disabilities, with whatever IEPs. I was not aware of with the LLL and I was in the Bureau of Exceptional Education and Student Services, but that was on the portion of the disabilities, not on the language or ESOL type. It's so I think that if it's an initiative of the parents that can um, educate uh, the legislation and the Department of Education. As parents, we have moved the needle in other areas uh, of education. So I think that we can move the needle on ELL. And to Enrique's point, when I work with legislators, they want to hear from parents and they want to hear from students. 
when they just hear from somebody like me as a professor, they think I'm just pontificating. So we, as parents, teachers, and students, are a much more powerful block than we feel like. Karen, you're on mute. Are you talking? I can talk <laughs> and just say thank you. And, and I was thinking, Dan, as Danielle asked that question, if there's no legal requirement for anyone to make a report, they're not going to do it on their own. So a lot of times we see reports because the legislature has, has written statutes that says they must report to us. And uh, so that's a thought process that maybe we should go through and see if there are reporting requirements that they're not complying with, or if there's not reporting requirements, then perhaps that's something as an organization we could be proactive with. Um, this is Danielle. So I, I appreciate hearing that. Um, we do have dual language programs here in Broward County, and um, there's been a large group of us and a few schools that have been together to form multi, you know, the Friends of Multilingual Education. And it came to, you know, to fruition in January that these programs that were provided by, you know, the district weren't really being funded appropriately and could kind of dismantle at any time and possibly not going to our feeder schools and so on and so forth. So it made us kind of dive in. And Florida is the only state in the United States that doesn't provide that information. Uh -huh. And there is federal dollars for these programs that are left on the table and not given to our students. And the only answer I get is, well, uh, we don't know. And I just don't understand how that is the answer, right? Because every other state does. So why is ours not? And like, how does the PTA help with that? You know, how can we ensure that we are, you know, a categorical light item in the funding that is given already by the federal government by just reporting that these programs exist? So I think that's a great task for us to look into, um, frankly. I love it, Danielle. Um, but there, there is a lot of things that Florida does not do uh, they, that they could be getting federal money for, but they choose not to. So the question is why or why not in any particular area? They don't want, they don't their want brother, their brother. Well, you know, and on, on our end, you know, I know that you could get a lot of support from Broward County um, PTA as like most of the schools that we work with have like, I'm, I'm, I'm the president of my school, our, our vice president on the board of my school, the vice president of the other school. So there is a lot of synergies between both of those, you know, between what we're doing with the PTA as well. So I'm sure we can get some support, I guess, for us, it's more of like, what is the best way to do it? We're kind of doing it on our own and we're meeting with local representatives and we've met with the legislative department at, you know, for Broward County Public Schools. So I guess, you know, I don't, I don't know those protocols on how to start and how can we get the PTA involved, but I'd, I'd love the opportunity to do that if it seems that there's some synergy on what you guys are trying to promote as well. Absolutely. We will connect you. Thank you. Bert? Danielle, what school are you with in Broward? Um, we're with River Glades Elementary in Parkland, Florida. Okay. We, 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 we can reach out to you. I see a hand uh, for Bert. Bert? I think. Had a hand up. 
Yeah, I just put it down. I just asked Daniel what what school she was with. Oh, okay. Okay, I think we are out of time if there's no more questions. But Ryan, if you don't mind slipping your email into the chat in case they missed it on the slide, um, whichever one you want to use um, as a resource, we appreciate it that you taking on the lead of this committee of multi-language learners. Thank you, Ryan. And um, should we have Madam President-elect close us out and make some announcements? Maxine sure. and Marie Lures. Uh, Karen, I'll fill in for Maxine. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for being here. I hope that you got as much new information as I did from Ryan's presentation. Uh, as always, this event was recorded and will be on our website for your review and for you to share with others. Uh, since I did come back, I'm gonna go ahead and plug Leadership Convention again. Please make sure you go ahead and register before June 1st so that you get that early bird rate. And if you've already registered and you'd like to add a meal or event, that option is also available to you. This summer's Leadership Convention promises to be full of opportunities for you to get both personal and professional training mingle with other like-minded advocate leaders and just have a little bit of fun. I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Have a good day. Thank you, Miss Mary. Okay, that looks like everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Ryan. Yes, yeah, fabulous. That was wonderful. Yes, Great. it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Definitely. I think we have something for you to work on, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Great right? presentation. Thank you, Ryan. It's good to see you as well. Thank you. Likewise, Carolyn. Okay. Yeah. All right. You all all right. Till we meet again. Right. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Hey. Happy Mother's Day. Same to you all. Okay.